Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ideas validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living and to my new mini-series Quantum Chat, microdosing spiritual insights in a food-for-thought style, where in each episode, together with my special and returning guest, Marin Muta, we focus on just one topic, one burning question, one quantum mystery that probably everyone has a view on, but no real answer to, as we can only speculate and guess, which is fun. Hi, Maren. Thanks for joining me again. <laughs> yes. How are you? I am great. How are you? Great. Great. And thank you so much for having me back. This is a lot of fun. Okay. So today's question is, are consciousness, higher self, and soul one and the same? Or are they different concepts and energies? Okay, let's see if we can shed some light on this conundrum. I feel that there is a lot of confusion or just a lack of consensus on the nature of these concepts, and these terms are often being used interchangeably, which is fine, I guess, but a lot of people like to have some certainty (laughs) or more detail. I see it as a hierarchy of sorts. So our consciousness steps down its energy to our soul, which then steps down to our higher self. Our individual higher self is an intermediary, in my view, between our conscious ego and our spiritual self, as it is recognized and accepted by the ego as a source of useful information. And so we can interact with it, receive insights and intuitive guidance from it, etc. Our soul is an individualized part of our consciousness, which has countless souls through which it experiences life. And of course, it is part of the collective consciousness, the creator, all that is. What is your view (laughs) on this conundrum? This is a fabulous question. So I do agree that our overarching consciousness, which some people might consider our higher self or our, the soul, okay, I'll do the soul separate, but the consciousness is massive. And I usually refer to it as a symphony and each life experience as one music note within the symphony. Or if we were to look at the overarching consciousness, like an orchard, then every apple in that orchard would be its own separate life experience, completely unique from each other. So in that sense, those two items are one and the same. If you want to differentiate something, let's say like the soul, there's really nothing living within this body. So there's not really a soul within this body. What I consider the soul would be like a little microscope for our overarching consciousness. And this body is the tool in which our overarching consciousness is observing this life experience. So if we were to look at the soul as the the teeny tiny part of our overarching consciousness that is watching this life, then yes. All of the information, all of the knowledge that we have here and ethereally resides on the other side of the veil. Again, the veil is just made by our brain, and the overarching consciousness is seeding information downward. So it's like a waterfall of information. And as we need information, our brain 
either opens it up and receives this information, or if the information is no longer relevant, the brain will mute that line of communication from the ethereal side. So that that's kind of what I think on this subject. It's a very interesting topic that we can go on for hours about. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else that is really important to know about this. I think the biggest thing is that you don't have something living within this body that has to ask permission or to get information from a higher self. Oh, that's the word I was looking for, higher self and consciousness. Higher self and consciousness, I'm going to say that's one and the same. Because information comes down like a waterfall. It is not going from down here up to the consciousness. The consciousness isn't learning from the earth from this earthbound body. It's using this earthbound body as an observation tool. And when this body, when this brain needs additional information, that's when it sends more information down or mutes it. Mm, absolutely. That's, that's an interesting point. I wouldn't say that our consciousness learns anything because I think that by definition, <laughs> our consciousness knows it all and it's got all the information and, and is timeless. When I would refer to the notion of learning, this is the learning for us as human being. And the process of observation by the soul or consciousness, perhaps to some extent being involved in the experiences that we have as human beings in this physical plane. And if someone would ask, okay, why? What's the point of going through those various experiences, often quite enduring and quite difficult, if our soul and our consciousness already has this information? Well, I don't think anyone could answer that question. I would suggest, and I've heard some voices along those lines, that this is essentially for the creator, so now we're talking about consciousness with a, with a big C, to experience and have fun. <laughs> See, one particular characteristic that not many people talk about of the consciousness with a big C or the creator, God, whatever you want to call it, is that it has a wonderful sense of humor and it wants to experience or have those experiences collected by the souls via human incarnations and other non-human incarnations for that matter. Well, for the lack of a better word, as an entertainment, <laughs> because otherwise it would be just be bored, stiff, you know, sitting, I mean, being everywhere. So the whole point of creation, which is another contentious perhaps point or interesting, curious point is why, you know, why, why God has created life? Why? And the only answer that I could come up with, well, why do you play? It is to play, to have fun, to have experience, to have, well, something to do, <laughs> if we can humanize that experience. But essentially, it is to collect all those experiences. That's why we have a margin of free will, because if everything absolutely was predestined, and that's, by the way, it's a topic for another conversation, there would be nothing for us to uh, surprise the creator with. And I have this intuitive feeling that there is an element of that. But coming back to our topic, consciousness, soul, and uh, higher self, why do you think is that in many mythologies, many stories, many teachings, the higher self is portrayed as this energetic almost being that acts and serves as an interface between our human ego and our spiritual self. Why do you think this is happening? Yeah. So the reason why I would believe that that's happening is because it's the translation of our brain, the translation of ethereal information. So our brain has to take any information that is coming in and translate it into something recognizable and into something relevant. So if we are trying to say, okay, who is out there? What is out there? 
it's going to make maybe the higher self look like a parent figure. Um, it might turn it into looking like spirit guides. It might turn it into a whole numerable things, just numerable things. And that's because one of the ideas that we have is that we are living on a linear path from birth to death and that we're down here learning things and we have to learn certain experiences on this linear path. Where our consciousness is, which is on the ethereal plane, it's not living and residing on this earthbound plane. So it gets to see the totality of our life and it gets to see that our life is not point A to point B. So anything that we see, anything that we communicate with each other is strictly a translation of information, a translation of frequency in order for us to communicate. So our brain is translating things that might not even exist here on earth, and we have to turn it into something that we can share with one another. So that's where a lot of these fables and stories and myths come from. Are they wrong? No, but they are also not full because our brain is limited on its capability of explanation. So it will simplify it. So it's something that we can understand and digest. Okay. What is your view on the purpose of the soul? <laughs> Harry well, question. Well, I, think, I think of the soul as, so if we, if, if we go and we're just going to model this picture like this. The soul is going to be the human body, okay? I don't believe that there's a soul living within the human body, but we're just going to pretend right now that the soul is the human body because a lot of people think that we actually have that spiritual entity living within this body. So the soul, we're going to say, is actually the vehicle, the observational vehicle for our overarching consciousness. That's the only purpose. The, the soul doesn't have to learn anything if this if we're taking the soul as the human body because our consciousness is observing how this body, how this soul reacts and responds and behaves to a multitude of situations. It's not how, you know, are they going to be able to pass physics and are they going to be able to bake a cake and are they going to be able to cross the street? That's not, yeah. it's not learning that. What it's doing is it's utilizing this soul, which is the body, as an observational vehicle. It's extraordinarily powerful and it's extraordinarily unique. And the reason why it's so unique is because this human body, yours and mine and anybody else who's here, will never be replicated. Even identical twins, even if we were to clone the body it will never be replicated because it will never, ever have the same vantage point. And that's where nature gives us hints. So nature is not out to fool us. Nature isn't sending us on a fool's errand. And nature isn't asking us to learn lessons that we have no idea what the lessons are. That's just cruel. That's not humor. That, that part is cruel. But when we look at nature, we can say, oh, well, these are the hints that no one will ever experience life like this body. No one will ever experience life like me or you. And that is what our overarching consciousness is looking for. Our overarching consciousness, that's what it's doing. It's observing that life. And to it, the totality of our life is absolutely stunning. Okay. I like this explanation, but I have one key question <laughs> to push the envelope. Okay. For what purpose? So you said that our consciousness is observing our life, how it unfolds and all experiences. My question is, why? For what purpose? Does it need it? Does it want it? So what is the purpose for our consciousness wanting to observe life experiences via the vehicle of the soul? What do you think? That's a good question. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we will not know that answer until we're dead, basically. But when we look at what we can look at here. This is why I describe the overarching consciousness as a symphony because, and then each life as a music note because literally it's creating a form of harmony. That's what the principle of least action ultimately is doing with our lives. So what the overarching consciousness is doing, it is using our life as a music note for its symphony. 
and it's looking for harmony. Now, this harmony, this energetic harmony that it is creating that will become part of this overarching symphony is extraordinarily powerful. And it's extraordinarily powerful because it actually equates to nothing. <laughs> and people are like, oh my gosh, what do you mean? I am nothing. And yes, you are going to become absolutely nothing. Now, before you think that that is what we think of nothing here on earth, it's exceedingly powerful on the ethereal side because it's such resonance that it far surpasses a love, it far surpasses comprehension and understanding, and it becomes. The word becomes is huge because right now we are like a hologram. We're in this vehicle. And once this life is done, we become, we become integrated with that overarching symphony. We become part of something so astounding and so beautiful that there are no way or words to explain it here on earth. Absolutely. So do you equate our consciousness with the consciousness many people describe with the capital C, the creator, God, whatever you want to call it? Or So in other words, is our individualized consciousness part of that larger consciousness, omnipresent consciousness, or you would not necessarily differentiate between the two? Yeah. So like we have this symphony that we are going to become a part of, that symphony itself, even though it has trillions of songs or music notes within it, will be a music note in and of itself that becomes part of, let's say, an even grander symphony. Okay. Yeah. That grander symphony, we'll go ahead and call it God. We'll call it, you know, the one creator, or whatever you want to call it. But we are literally part of that. But the but once we leave here, there's still individualism. It's just not individualism like we see it on a third dimensional plane. Yeah. And by the way, I love your analogy of a symphony because it's just, it speaks to me so beautifully. And I think the symphony comes closest to this concept. So thank you. So there we go. A brief answer to the question with the consciousness, how yourself and soul are one and the same or different concepts, or at least some food for thought. Thank you, Maren. We'll speak again in the next edition of Quantum Chat. Thank you for having me. And if you guys want to give us some feedback, which would be great, go ahead and click on the link below this audio and we'll take you to Anna's website, which will have her email address on it. And you can go ahead and leave a review or give your comments, questions, and concerns to her. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.